morning, everyone. Good to see everyone. It's nice and warm inside as, as opposed to outside, isn't it? Uh, but uh, this is Indiana, so this is the kind of weather we get this time of year. So i um, glad to see everyone. I know that we have uh, several uh, joining us uh, online, and uh, we're so thankful that we uh, continue to have the technology and the means to do that. So uh, again, just want to welcome everyone here this morning and then also everyone that's um, worshiping with us from home uh, also. And especially if you, this is your first time worshiping with us, I want to thank you for, for doing so and uh, hope that uh, you'll, you'll come back and, and worship with us um, in the future. Obviously, if we have anybody local that's looking for a church home and um, just isn't uh, comfortable meeting with us in person just yet, we understand, but we encourage you to do so when we, when we do open the doors uh, for that opportunity. So I'm looking forward to uh, the next hour so we can kind of take those things that may be on our minds and turn those over to the Lord. Um, I know we can't always just totally remove them, but at the same time, it's just a reminder this morning, if you're struggling with uh, anything, um, that this is a good opportunity to turn it over to the Lord and let him help you through that. And then obviously for this family to help you as well. So before we uh, begin everything this morning, if you don't mind, I'd like to say a prayer. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be here this morning. Father, we know that we have some that are traveling. We pray that you'll be with them and, and uh, protect them and keep them safe. As I mentioned before, we also know that we have many that just aren't comfortable uh, being here just yet, and especially with uh, the temperature being as cold as it is. Um, just pray that you be with all of us as we... Uh, come together, either here or, or online, to, to worship you. Father, I pray for uh, strength and guidance throughout uh, our daily worship, uh, but also uh, when we come together uh, and worship you uh, collectively, like we are doing right now. We pray your blessings upon us. We, we pray your blessings upon uh, our worship to you and our service to you. Father, we we just thank you so much also for all the blessings that you continue to bestow upon us, even throughout this pandemic. It's amazing to me how much you love us, how much you care for us, and how you continue to make sure that our needs are being met. Father, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that everything we say and do here will be in accordance with uh, your will and it will bring you the honor and the, the glory that uh, you deserve. Father, I also want to thank you for your son and his sacrifice for us. And Glenn, again, we uh, are so thankful for the hope that um, we know that we have and receive as a result of Jesus' sacrifice. Be with us now as we worship you. Pray that our hearts are in the right place. We pray that as we lift our voices up to you this morning, that they will be pleasant to you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Why did the Savior heaven leap and come to earth below? Where men his grace would not receive because he loved me so.
just to take a moment to uh, prepare your communion. And again, welcome everyone to uh, this morning's communion service. And I'm just very glad to be able to be here today and, and to share, you know, in our remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his willingness to be a perfect sacrifice for each of us. In Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. You know, as we take communion this morning together, we need to remember that God's grace comes freely to us. It was Jesus who paid the price with his blood so that God sees only the righteousness that comes from the faith that we have in him. Only the body and blood of Jesus can redeem us through his death and resurrection on the cross. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, I'll leave you with this, speaking about Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we take this bread now in remembrance of the great sacrifice that you gave to us through giving us your son as a sacrifice for our sins. Even though we were not deserving of it, you gave your son to pay the price for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us have a, a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Again, Heavenly Father, we come to you in remembrance of the blood that was shed on our behalf, the price that was paid by your Son, Jesus, the love that you have shown us through that sacrifice is the most wonderful gift we will ever have. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> that concludes our communion service this morning. Uh, there will be a a prayer for the offering at the end of service today. Thank you.
you turn your Bibles to the book of John, third verse, where 16 and uh, where this is where verses 16 and 17 will be our scripture reading for this morning. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not son, send his Son into the world to, to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Good morning. Here we are on a beautiful, very, 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 very cold day, worshiping our Lord. And it's always beautiful when we get to do that. But also a day in which we're celebrating love, Valentine's Day. And of course, romantics all over the world are trying to find clever ways to express love to their valentine. And I'm not a poet, and the only poem I know is, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. But I guarantee if I used that on my wife, it wouldn't go very well. So thank goodness for Hallmark. When it comes to love, I believe the Bible does a much, much better job than Hallmark or any one of us could ever do explaining love. And perhaps one of the best known verses in all of scripture is John 3, 16 and 17, which was just read and we want to read again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God expressed his love for man. He could have just said, I love you, and that would have been sufficient but he chose to express it. And he expressed it by giving. We all know that God loves us, but the question is, do we love God as we should? And do we love each other as we should? How do we know we love him? How do we show it? Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, that if you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience is our expression of our love to him. That's how we express our love back. But besides from that, the Bible helps us to understand the real nature of this thing called love. And my prayer is that we would all pay close attention to this message that we would seek to understand what godly biblical love looks like so that we know how to apply it to our marriages and all of our relationships. First, I want to begin with the idea that love is a commitment. There's an interesting story found in Genesis chapter 24. Sarah has died and Abraham, it says, is well advanced in age. And he arranges for one of his servants to go back to his homeland of Haran to find a wife for his son Isaac. The servant goes, he finds Rebekah, arranges for her to come back with him to marry Isaac. And that story constitutes the bulk of chapter 24 of Genesis. But it's the conclusion that we find in that chapter that really got my attention. And it's where Isaac and Rebekah meet for the very first time. But in chapter 24, beginning in verse 62, 
It says, Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. And he went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac, and she got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, you wouldn't necessarily call this love at first sight and all romantic and everything else. But in this simple story, there's this enduring lesson. And it's found in the phrase, so she became his wife and he loved her. But notice here, there's no dating, no engagement ring. There's no premarital counseling that took place. Shouldn't this read, Isaac loved Rebecca and then she became his wife? That's the way we would do it if it was written in our time. Our society equates love with feelings and emotion, with romanticism. And love is defined in terms today of hormones and pheromones, and when those are gone, so is love. But not so in this story. Love is defined here in terms of commitment, of covenant. Commitment equaled foundation of marriage. Feelings we know come and go, but covenant is always the baseline. So many times when I conduct premarital counseling, a couple will begin by describing their feelings when they talk about love. And then it's my job to get them to see that love is a, is a decision and a commitment that we make to one another. The vows we share in a traditional ceremony is about making of a commitment. Because we know feelings often change, do they not? Sometimes you just don't feel like you love that person. But you remember the commitment. Well, this month alone, we have three couples celebrating anniversaries. Last Sunday, we mentioned Lonnie and Helen Schutman celebrating 62 years. This past Thursday, Paul and Pat Healy shared 60 years. Even this last Friday, Charlie and Wanda, 16 years. So how does a marriage last 16 to 62 years? It lasts when two people take their covenant seriously. The next passage that I want to focus on comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. And the passage is addressed specifically to husbands, but that doesn't mean that the rest of us should just tune it out. In fact, wives, you might want to take some notes might come in handy when you need to remind your husband, don't do that. <laughs> Single guys that are watching or in the room, young men, you need to pay attention because this passage describes the kind of love that you ought to have for a future wife. And the young women should pay attention because this passage supplies you with a standard by which you should measure every future relationship. If a man does not treat you the way with the kind of love this passage describes, he's not the man you want to marry. I'm just going to put it out there. So Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 33 talk about love being a commitment, but also look, it's a sacrifice. And it says, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church 
without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two of them will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but Paul says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So we look at this passage, and this is really a, a beautiful passage, but at the same time, it's also an intimidating proposition for any Christian household. God tells us that our relationship with our wives is a symbol of the relationship he has between himself and his people. And as such, we as men have the awesome and solemn responsibility of modeling God's love toward his people in our relationships with our wives. But also notice the ladies were not off the hook here because he said wives need to respect their husbands. Well, that word respect carries just as much weight as the word love for the men. And so you have a solemn responsibility as well. And part of that responsibility is in your submission, the way you support and strengthen and respect the leadership role that he's been given. So I see characteristics of love that ought to be reflected in our relationships here. Second, love, we need to understand, needs to be sacrificial. When we think of Christ's sacrifice for the church, we're immediately drawn to the cross, are we not? The passage that was read for us earlier from John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world. Well, how much did he love? That little word so says a whole lot because that little word allowed him to sacrifice. He gave everything in that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, see, it wasn't guaranteed that any of us was going to believe, but he did it in, for someone. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Aren't you glad for that? Because now we have this relationship. But that the world through him might be saved. You look again at Ephesians 5, 25. And husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What are we supposed to be doing for our wives, men? We're supposed to be giving up. Giving ourselves up for her. Loving our wives as Christ loved the church. That's sacrifice. Jesus loved us and sacrificed. He chose to die on the cross to win our hearts. If that is our example, how do we apply it? I doubt that any of us will ever really be called on to, to literally die for our spouses. So how do we love sacrificially? Sacrificial love is going to look different in every relationship but it will always involve giving of yourself for the other. Put simply, sacrificial love is about putting the other person before yourself, and that can be applied in a lot of ways, and that's probably something that every one of us in this room and everyone watching could do better. The thing to remember is that Christ's love for the church was without limits. 
He held nothing back. He sacrificed who he was as God to step into our shoes, to live our life, and to die for each one of us. Consider how our Savior's description of love contrasts with the world's. And how does the concept of sacrificial love encourage you to relate differently to those you say you love? I kind of was thinking of some ideas. You know, we've got some young families now in this congregation who are having babies. And sacrificial love might mean getting up in the middle of the night and letting your wife sleep. It might mean when you're here at church that the man gets up and takes the baby to the nursery so mom can be spiritually fed. It might mean sacrificing a hobby or whatever it is to care for those in your household. Whatever that love looks like, whatever that sacrifice looks like, are you expressing it? The next thing I want us to see is that love is sanctifying. In verse 26 and 27 of Ephesians 5, it says that he was doing this to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. I do like the translations that says as a radiant bride, without stain or wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Jesus died so that you and I could have a meaningful relationship with God, so that we could become holy and righteous in his eyes, which is something we were created to be all along. Our spouses need us to be the same way. Husbands, your wives need you to be the spiritual leader of your home. Far too many men in the church have a reputation for abandoning that role as spiritual leader. Many sit at home while the mom gets the kids up and comes on Sundays. Or maybe they attend church, but they never really take that relationship serious. For the men that are here today, please understand, I'm not trying to tear anyone down. I'm trying to lift us all up. I'm trying to remind us, to encourage us. Because our wives, you look around this world, you look at what's going on. Do our wives and our children need us to be the spiritual leaders? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want you to think back in the garden of Adam uh, in the garden of Adam in the garden of Eden Adam had one job and that job was to be protector of all that was in the garden including his wife but he failed how do I know that scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 that she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband, who was what? Who was with her. Do you ever pay close attention to that? The whole time she's being tempted, where is Adam? With her, right? She didn't have to go looking for him. He's right there. He watched her being tempted. He watched her disobey God. And he did nothing. He should have stomped on that snake the first minute it started talking. But he didn't. He didn't fulfill the responsibility to present her holy and blameless before God. And far, far too many men are following in Adam's footsteps. You remember what he did do when he was confronted by God? 
when God finally comes into the garden and confronts both of them, Adam says, well, it was the woman you gave me. He put the blame in two places. Never looking at what his responsibility was. He said, oh, it was that old woman that you gave me. I knew this was going to happen. And it's your fault for giving her to me. Have we done that? Guys, if we would take our faith seriously, we'd start growing in Christ and leading our families in the same direction. I really believe it would totally change the climate of our relationships. It could save a troubled marriage or it could take a good marriage and make it great. And if you're not sure where to start, start with prayer. Praying for your wife and even praying with her is powerful. And again, this is something we could all do better. But it strengthens the bond of marriage. It encourages unity. It promotes intimacy. And most importantly, it invites God into the marriage. I know it's something we could do better. Please hear this, especially you men, as this is addressed to us. If we really love our wives, we will guide, her, guide them and lead them out of sin and into a life-altering relationship with our Father. Because sanctifying love wants you to be the best you possible. The final thing that I want us to focus on is that love is unconditional. I want to go back to the John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, now this is where I want us to pay attention, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the mystery of an infinite God, he chose to love finite man. And such a choice on his part is completely voluntary. It was without any external influence. From our viewpoint, everything is conditional in this life, is it not? I mean, think about it. Money-back guarantees come with hidden strings. Signed documents have fine print, and you better read the fine print. We live in a world that places conditions on all types of things. And such conditions affect how we understand God and how we relate to him. Therefore, many times our view of God is highly distorted. But we can see the unconditional love of God a characteristic that we need to express in our relationships. And we find it through the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. We're not going to necessarily turn there right now, but you remember the younger son comes to dad and he demands his portion of the inheritance. And, and the father we know loves his son and he, he grants the desire. But as soon as the son has what he wants, he takes off and leaves home. And he says he goes off into a foreign land and he wastes everything in wild, lustful living. And then we're told that he comes back to his senses and he wants to go home. And you remember he rehearses this, this huge confession that he wants to give to his father because he knows that all the things he's done, he has no right to go back home and expect to be received as a son. He just wants to be like one of his father's servants. So he makes the trip back home. And as he begins confessing his sins, we can see a picture of a father who, who was desiring for that boy to be back home because of love. And he stops him mid-sentence. He doesn't even get it out of what all he's done. But the father stops him, and he starts calling out to his servant. 
And we see in verses 22 through 24, But the father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be what? Merry. Unconditional love brought reconciliation. The son received more than he ever asked for and more than he could ever imagine. Because the ring on the hand symboled the idea that this was my boy. And he has the authority of my boy. And the sandals on his feet again was the idea of relationship because the servants didn't wear sandals. So he said, this boy means something to me. And then put the robe on his back. Oh, that's that royal robe. The robe of distinction. And then bring the fatted calf. That was for special occasion. What was the occasion? My boy was dead. He's now alive. He was lost and now he's found. He's home. Let's celebrate. Understand there is absolutely nothing you or I could ever, ever do to merit the love of God. The only way in which he could love us is because he himself is love. And that's what we find over in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. That's what the prodigal son experienced. In this love, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God's love is unconditional. You and I were unlovely, but God loved us anyway. And he wants us to love the, just the same. Now, it doesn't take too much imagination to realize that this command of Jesus to love is one that so many times we take too lightly. To love as Jesus seems way out of reach at times. To let love rule everything we say and do seems almost impossible because we fail over and over. That's not to say, though, that we're poor lovers and we should give up. But it does mean that we need the love of Christ more than ever before. We need his sacrificial, sanctifying, unconditional, never-failing love to forgive us for our lack of love. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that God doesn't love us like we love others. And my hope for each one of us, me included, is that we may love as Christ has loved us because of these characteristics. We can repent of our sin. We can confess Jesus as the Son of God. We can be baptized, dying to self, resurrecting in this new relationship. And Scripture tells us that he will be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that what we ultimately want anyway? 
Isn't that what we desire? To be loved, to be forgiven, to be restored. Right now we offer this invitation for you to receive the love of God this morning. If you're here and need to respond, we encourage you to do that, but we're going to ask that you would make your way to the back of the auditorium and meet myself or one of the elders. If you're online and watching this morning, if there's anything that we can do to help you, contact us, please. But don't let this opportunity slip you by. We're here to help. We're here to assist you. If we can help you in any way, please respond right now as we stand and sing. sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no 